You're listening to The Dirt on the Past, a show on history and archaeology and why it matters today. You can find us on the Extreme History Project website and also on kgbm.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past from the Extreme History Project and KGBM Community Radio. Whether digging up a site or dusting off the archives, we bring you some of the most fascinating and cutting-edge research in history and archaeology and discuss why it matters today. Join me, Nancy Mahoney, alongside co-host Crystal Alegria, as we converse with anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians about how they bring the past alive. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are the co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we are at the Extreme History Headquarters speaking via Zoom with Dr. Taya Miles. And we are so excited to talk with Taya about um, her most recent book. But Crystal, before we get into that, how was your week? What's been going on with you at Extreme History? It was a great week. And the reason for that is because I got an email from Podbean, which is our podcast host, that said that we just reached our 5,000 download mark. Yay! For the podcast. That's Yay. a nice round number. Yeah. I know. I know. So we've been doing this since, are we about a year now? Is this about um, right? Maybe about a year, maybe a little less than a year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we started, I think, last September. Okay. Yeah. So we're not quite there, but uh-huh. almost every week through the year, but we're up close to 40 episodes. Yeah. And yes. Yeah. And 5,000 downloads, which is pretty exciting. Well, that makes me yeah. feel good. There are at least a couple of people listening besides yeah. my family members, which is <laughs> nice to know. Um, yeah. And then this week, I think we finally got a break from all the smoke in the air, too. Huh? I know. That's been really yeah. brutal. So and- it's been really smoky here in, in Montana. And uh, the first couple days of this week were just awful. I yeah. mean, it was really bad. Right. Um, but it's been raining um, and, and in like the, you know, 50 degrees. It feels like we went from 90 degree summer to, you know, winter. To fall. Yeah, really right quickly. away, right in time for yeah. back to school shopping. So yeah. Mocha is Perfect. filled with people all good, coming in, good. tourists and locals, which has been fun to see. Um, and I'm sure you guys have a ton of people um, for the walking tours because we yeah. still seem to have a lot of tourists and Smoke or rain, I'm sure they're showing up, huh? They're showing up, you know, because our walking tours end Labor Day weekend, which is just right around the corner. So I think people are trying to get in a walking tour before, especially locals, um, trying to get in walking tours before the season ends. So, nice. um, But, of course, we have this last little push of uh, tourists as well. So, yeah. so it's good. It's been good. Good, yeah. good. Well, my summer has ended. I was up in Flathead Lake with my whole family, who oh, I hadn't fun. seen in uh, well over a year, oh, and fun. we celebrated all sorts of things we had missed, which was good. Um, but I think that's enough about us, and yes. we should now get back to we the should. interview. We so, should. Yeah. yeah. So, Taya, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here, and congrats on your 5,000th download. Thank you. Right. I think with you, that you're going to bump us up quite yeah. a bit after this, so we're <laughs> very excited. I want to start off by telling our listeners a little about you, Taya. So Dr. Taya Miles is a professor of history and the Radcliffe Alumni Professor in History at Harvard University. She's also the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship and the Height Prize in the Humanities from the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture. Dr. Miles is the author of several books, including The Dawn of Detroit, which won the Frederick Douglass Book Prize, among other honors, as well as the acclaimed book Ties That Bind, The House on Diamond Hill, a novel The Cherokee Rose, and Tales from the Haunted South, which is a published lecture series. Her most recent book is All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley's Sack, A Black Family Keepsake. Well, welcome, Taya. And we always start off by asking our guests how they came to the field of history. So, Taya, how did you make your way into this profession? Well, it's been quite a a winding had crystal when i was a little girl i spent a lot of time with my grandmother who was a wonderful storyteller and she would talk about her time growing up in mississippi and what it was like to have a family garden there she also told some um, very distressing stories about uh, racial coercion and violence there and i took these stories to heart at the same time while i was a kid 
I loved walking around my neighborhood and going into abandoned houses. Oh boy, I'm sure your mom my, wasn't super excited about that. My mother habit. did not know this. <laughs> my grandmother did not know this. But I would just, I mean, there were plenty of them. And I would just make my way in and look through the rubble and, you know, find really old shoes from the early 1900s. Oh, and wow. Oh, wow. And oh, that's neat. Just think about who lived there and what their lives were like. But I never associated the storytelling or going into these old homes with history mm. or with anything like the historical profession. When I was in high school, I was not a fan of history. I, uh, <laughs> this is probably terrible to say, but I disliked my U.S. history courses in high mm. school. Uh, I, I thought that the material was cold and rigid, a little bit boring. I felt extremely uncomfortable when the subject turned to slavery because, you know, this was still at a time, and I really hope the times have changed, but still at a time when um, if you were a Black kid or a kid of color in a predominantly white classroom and the topic had to do with African-American history, but history of people of color, uh, the teacher and the student would turn to you And almost expect Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. to teach the class or read your face for your reactions to discussion of your ancestors' enslavement. That was my experience of high school U.S. history, Mm -hmm. and I really disliked it. How uncomfortable. Yeah. It was was very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and and worse than that, worse than uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So when I got to college, I studied literature. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I was in graduate school in American studies with a number of faculty members and faculty mentors who were historians, that I realized that the kinds of stories that I had enjoyed and, and learned from so much as a child were actually oral history, family history, and that those houses that I was going into were historical repositories. Right, and so right. I then shifted my focus to history. It's so interesting to me that that I, I had a similar feeling when I started taking courses in American studies as a graduate student and realizing that the history I had encountered in in high school and earlier on wasn't really the amazing history that was being done. And there's, I feel like there is still a disconnect. I hope my kids are getting better histories now, but I still think there's a a gap there that, um, Mm -hmm. that's what's so exciting. I think about as we get to talking about your work, about what your work is, um, doing and and um, actively seeking to do, you know, is to make it more accessible to mm-hmm. all kinds of readers and could be assigned in high school, you know, mm-hmm. as well as undergraduate mm-hmm. work. Yeah. Well, I mean, I agree with you, Nancy. There are still so many gaps, but there has been change. There has been progress. And, mm-hmm. and I try to hold on to that. Yes. <laughs> have a, yeah. a sense of um, of hope about where it is that we're going to be in another, you know, five years, 10 years, and so on. Mm-hmm. So we want to um, dive into your book a little bit more, unless there was more you wanted to say about how you became a historian. Ooh, well, thank you for that opening. I, you know, I do want to piggyback on your comment about American studies, because American studies is the field that I was trained in in graduate school. And it's a field that I love because of its openness and because of its flexibility. It is allowed me and actually encouraged me to ask a wide range of questions and to explore various kinds of strategies and then to employ a number of different kinds of tools. And if that had not been the case, I know that I would not be doing historical work right now. Right. It seems that the format there was more flexibility is sort of the the wishy-washy answer I got when I would constantly ask, what is the difference between American studies and history? Because I shared so many of my classes with his people in the history department. Um, and I think what I did like about it was that it, it allowed me to, to delve into a story I wanted to tell that I don't think I would have been able to do if I had been trained in a much more I don't, I don't want to say formulaic and rigid because I think historians are becoming more flexible all across the board, Mm -hmm. but, but there was still a sense of this was the way they had been trained as scholars. And and so with American studies, I think it being a more recent discipline, there wasn't that same sense that you had to be rigidly carrying on, I guess, in the same vein. Um, But aside from that, 
Um, I think your book is such an amazing example, and it would be something that if I were teaching a class on American studies, I would most definitely assign for my students to read. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful. And um, Crystal and I are really trying hard not to fangirl out. So we're just going (laughs) to... Talk. I want to give a little bit of a background, um, so I'm going to say the name of it again, give a very kind of short synopsis, and um, and then we want to ask you sort of some some more specific questions after that. So um, again, the the name of the book is All That She Carried: The Journey of Ashley's Sack, a Black Family Keepsake, and. This book is in some ways, I think, like your other books and in other ways, a bit of a departure because um, from the outset of the book, this sack itself becomes central to how you tell the story of the people around it and how you then contextualize both the sack and the people involved in it. So the sack itself, um, for our listeners, was embroidered in 1921 by a woman named Ruth Middleton. It has 10 short lines that relay the history of the Sack and her family ancestors, including her grandmother, Ashley. Nearly 70 years earlier in South Carolina, Ashley was just nine years old, and she was handed that sack by her enslaved mother, Rose, as she was about to be sold. In the sack, Rose had placed a folded dress, three handfuls of pecans, and a braid of her own hair, and then told her that she loved her. So Rose's words, what she said to Ashley, as she thought she might never see her again, were recorded in stitches on the bag um, by her then descendant, her great-granddaughter Ruth. So I just want to read then what Ruth stitched on to the sack. My great grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair. Told her it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother. Ruth Middleton, 1921. And there's a lot to unpack in the way this is stitching and the color of the thread that changes through this narrative that she has stitched into this sack. But this really powerful object is something, once you encountered it, started this whole journey you went on to write this book. So we'd love you to start by telling us a little bit about how you came to know the existence of this sack, learn about it, and then came to write this book. Well, this sack has had um, a really interesting history as an item of material culture. It has been moved by the women who used it, packed it, passed it down. And it's also been relocated in our present day by shoppers and by um, museum scouts and museum curators. I first saw the sack when it was in Washington, DC at the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And this was in 2016. Uh, Soon after the museum had opened, I had been uh, invited to write a review of the new museum by the Public Historian Journal. And so I had a really wonderful and special opportunity to walk through the galleries with just one curator before the museum opened for the day. And then she actually told me that I was free to go where I wanted to go. Nice. So while she went back to her work and um, it was just me with these incredible items, including what's now known as Ashley's sack. And spending time alone with this, this textile, even though it was on a wall and it was encased, was incredibly moving for me. You read the inscription. The words are so raw and so mm. beautiful mm. and and seeing these words sewn 
get embroidered into a fabric, realizing that generations of Black women actually touched this thing. It just, for me, it was, it was a gut punch. I can't even explain how I felt when I saw it. I just, I felt like I hadn't seen anything so beautiful and so terrible that seemed to gather in its folds and you know hold within it the entire history of enslavement. I mean, um, the center, the, the core, the meaning of what it meant to be an unfree person, to be an unfree woman, to be an unfree child in the United States. And so when I encountered it, I, I felt that I had no choice but to write about it. It wasn't my plan, actually, <laughs> to write about this. Uh, I'm one of these people, I think there are, are many of us who um, have, you know, have so many books that they want to write, so many ideas that they want to pursue. There's not even enough time, you know, in a lifetime to get them all out. And I had another plan. Uh, in fact, you two probably heard a preview of that plan a few years ago when I spoke in Bozeman, because I have been working for uh, a long time on a history of Black women in the West. Oh, yeah. I'm very interested in Black women in Montana, mm-hmm. interested in a woman named Maddie Kastner. Right. You know, yes. oh, I see you recognize yes. you're not yep. you recognize yep. Maddie. Yes, yes. You got to write yes. that someday, but yeah. okay, we'll wait, you we'll know, wait. I, I, I must write that, right? <laughs> yes. And um, I've done some research on it. I've done a little bit of speaking and publishing on it. That was my plan. The next book was going to be the study of Black women in the West, which is fascinating. Yeah. But that project had to be put on hold because the sack was just utterly mind-blowing for me. And I have been to a lot of museums. I have seen a number of artifacts of enslavement. And um, these artifacts all tell many stories. They're all incredibly moving. It's painful to view and to be in the space of many of them especially when it comes to chains, mm. shackles, mm-hmm. neck irons, mm. when it comes to very small shackles, which could only have been used on children. And yet, this piece of fabric, for me, it was just, um, it was undeniably the most absorbing material culture artifact that I had seen. And so I determined that I was going to work on it. And and, uh, at that time, I didn't quite know what that was going to entail. Uh, I I had the the hope and the thought that I would be able to track down the specific people and uh, the places and the dates that are embroidered on the sack. I had the hope that I'd be able to identify um, where the sack was actually produced, the initial, you know, cotton Mm -hmm. container and who made it. (laughs) Right. But I was in for a surprise. (laughs) Which happens. (laughs) It happens. Yes, indeed. But it became, I mean, it did hold so much information. It had names and a date Mm -hmm. and and aspects of its manufacture that you could use to narrow. And and what an amazing, fascinating starting point. Um, I have to say, there is something about this particular object. Obviously, you were talking about how, how visceral it is and in trying to think about why it's different from some of the other objects. I, I think your book goes into that really well, but just to to sum up, I think for, um, I mean, as a woman, as a mother, any of us sitting in this room, the thought of, and and the, the story is told just with not a spare word, you know, on there. It's mm-hmm. just so straightforward, but just, you know that there was a fully, you get the fuller picture of the people that were going through this, which I think even sometimes chains and shackles, there's a reducing kind of quality to those artifacts where this has um, 
an opening blossoming i'm not using the right words but it feels like it's inviting you to the to the into the personal to the full fully dimensional human that gave it filled it carried it embroidered it you know all of those so and and then the the fact that it was cherished over time um and kept is is part of the whole beauty and and story there um so one of the things you you talk about early on in the in your book in your introduction and and you weave through is the challenge of writing about people from the past like Rose and Ashley um that are hard to track through the archives now from what i understand you do most of your research looking at histories of african american people enslaved people native american people and and very often almost primarily women so Taya, you're really <laughs> you're really going for the people who are not there. Like they're least likely to be mentioned in their own words in the archives or in in ways in in, in which they are uh, having a voice for themselves. So you you've set your career up, you know, with this incredible challenge. And I think this story, one of the the lovely things about it for the reader is you you are explaining the process and decisions as you go along. So we learn how you can actually do this work and, and come to know them. So that's one of the things I wanted you to um, speak about is this conundrum of the existing archives. You quote Nell Irvin Painter saying, you have to learn how to peer between and beyond the lines of the written record, especially an archive that distorts the rendering of enslaved people, even as people. Um, so trying to figure out how to, how to stretch sources, you use a lot of textile metaphors, how to stretch sources so we can read more into them, um, how to read along, uh, the bias grain. I think that was a quote from Marisa Fuentes and all these ways in which you're kind of using the cloth as an archive, as part of an archive, but then you also have to go into more traditional archives and then other untraditional ones. So please talk a little bit about that process of writing about people who don't have a whole archival, traditional archival paper record. Nancy, you just said so much in that question. <laughs> you said I, so I'm much. sorry. I have a bad <laughs> habit of doing that. <laughs> just do what you want with your answer. <laughs> well, I mean, even, even your framing, even the way that you were, that you were, um, bouncing off of the last thing I said presented so much more that we could talk about. Right. So this may be a bit of a meandering response, but the first thing I want to say is that you're right. You're so right about the ways in which Ashley Sack, this textile is different and, and the reasons why it feels different. And I just want to touch on that for a moment and say that part of the difference or the distinction of it is its material. There is um, a world of space between a textile, you know, a fabric and something that is hard and solid and punishing, like, like a shackle. Mm. And one thing that I try to do in the book, as you mentioned, is to think about textile history, to think about the particular relationship that women have had with textiles across uh, many cultural formations and uh, across centuries and even millennia. And I tried to think about as well, the human intimacy with textiles, the ways in which textiles are among our closest materials, the things that we swaddle our infants in, the things that we use to um, shelter our bodies, the things that we wrap the sick in, and the dead and the dying in mm. the ways that we express our creativity and our love of color and our, and our love of family and so on. So many things. Mm. And so part of the, the way in which this particular artifact communicates is through its materiality, mm. through the fact that it is a piece of fabric. It is a textile that has uh, then been layered and deepened by way of embroidery, by way of a needle art. I think that that speaks to us on so many dimensions as human beings uh, and as women 
and of people who may not be women, but who who may be very engaged with textile arts and with, and with needle arts. So there's that. And there's also, as you mentioned, the elegant, almost simplicity of the lines themselves that Ruth Middleton embroidered. In the book, I talk about how the lines on the sack can be experienced like a poem. Mm -hmm. And of course, poetry gets us right here, right? Right. Because poetry Mm -hmm. has this this quality. I mean, it has, I think, the uh, intentionality has the aim and a quality of taking us right to the emotional marrow of experience. And poetry is all about kind of shedding excess verbiage, getting rid of all that stuff that we, you know, uh, layer into our prose. Right. And uh, boiling things down to their essence. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the embroidery on the sack, which is very spare, as you said, that has that similar kind of effect of taking us to the essence. And what that essence seems to be is love. Mm -hmm. The deep love, care, affection between a mother and a daughter, which I extrapolate out to interpret as this is a deep love within Black families. This is a deep love across Black extended kin. This is a deep love between mothers and daughters of any background. This is a deep love between families of any background. This is a deep love that humanity can and sometimes does exhibit. And so uh, the SAC managed to do all these things, partly because of its material, partly because of um, the structure and the form of Ruth Middleton's embroidery, and partly because of what it tells us that it is about. Because the SAC is a source, and it becomes the primary piece of evidence that I have to work with in this book. And so um, even though when I started trying to think about it very carefully, I put on my academic hat and I was trying to be, you know, somewhat distant and I was shying away from this whole emotional realm. Love clearly is what Ruth Middleton was thinking about. And Ruth Middleton, uh, by all evidences, received this story by way of um, orality, oral, oral history in her family, which indicates that love is very much what Ruth's mother, who was Rosa, and her mother, who was Ashley, and her mother, who was Rose, was thinking about. And so this item, in its materiality, and in its form, in its language, and in its core idea, uh, it just gets us in our hearts, Mm -hmm. because that's what it's about. But you asked a question about method, right? Mm-hmm. And about uh, archives. Um, I found this project to be very difficult. Notwithstanding the fact that you laid out that all of my books have been pretty difficult <laughs> in that, <laughs> in that uh, I have tended to select topics where there wasn't as much secondary literature as I really needed and would have loved to have seen. And where there was not as much primary material as Um, I would have wished. And yet this has been the hardest one by far. I mean, I thought that I had no sources (laughs) when I was working on uh, enslavement to native societies, (laughs) but actually I had an avalanche of sources in comparison to the documentation that exists about these particular women whose names are embroidered on the sack. Mm. At first that felt very frightening for me and I wasn't even sure if I should pursue the project in a manuscript, you know, book link form. But it was so compelling that I couldn't turn away from it. And in the end, I feel that the challenge of the artifact, the paucity of sources, made the work much more illuminating because it, it forced me to be creative in a way that I had not been before in my work. It forced me to learn about new questions and new approaches, particularly within uh, material culture studies, kind of 
leaning into mm-hmm. art historical studies mm-hmm. and maybe just a tad little bit of archaeological, just a tad <laughs> of <Yeah. laughs> archaeological yeah. studies. And it also really compelled me to write this book in a different way. Mm. I was not going to be able to write a book that said, um, this happened, that happened, and this happened. You know, see footnotes five, six, and seven. Right. right. Yep. Right. Yep. <laughs> Instead, I had to write a book that was more about this is what this act means. This is what we can perhaps come to understand about Black women's experiences, about enslavement, about women's experiences, about human experiences by way of this act. This is how we begin. We can begin to think about approaches to projects like these, which really must be done. Mm-hmm. Right. Because if we say we're not going to work on this or that or the other because it's only a handful of sources, we'll be turning our backs on the lives of many marginalized people and on stories that could be quite instructive for us as individuals and as families and communities today. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to an orientation to, let's say, traditional historical methods or an orientation to the archives in this project, what I end up doing is accepting, just first of all, accepting that the best source that exists about these women and their sack is the embroidery itself and is the artifact. You know, period. (laughs) This is what we have. Right. right. And the fact that yeah. it, it is still in existence, you know, yeah. it's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. I mean, it existed beyond the fact that um, Rose would never see Ashley again. Like the power right. of that, the sack is still there to tell the story. You right. know, and you have to you have to tell that story with a certain amount of emotion and reverence. You know, I mm-hmm. you can't not lean into that. But I I have wondered how it must feel as a historian with a an academic career to to make that choice, which I think you did bravely and well, but I'm sure that you had a lot of thinking about it and talking to people about it. Yeah. You mean to make the choice to, to, to be tell a, the story? Yeah, or? to tell the story and to, to, I think, in some ways include your own, you know, choices about yes. how to tell it in the story itself. Yes. Well, it was a journey. I mean, one thing that I have, always done in my work is to show my work Mm -hmm. that is to try to do thick footnoting to try to point within the text itself to try to point to what it is that I'm asking and how it is that I'm approaching and trying to answer those questions and I've done that because I was always working on um, subjugated groups right with without as much documentation about them as other groups have. Mm-hmm. And so it was always important to say, this is what I'm asking. This is how I'm speculating. This is what I think, but here's how I got there. So mm-hmm. you can go back and double check me. Maybe I got it wrong. Please double check me. Yeah. And um, please see the material for your for yourself and for yourselves. And that has been, I think, one of the most important aspects of my own process in the past when I was working on enslavement, Black enslavement in in Cherokee society, I knew that I was conducting the research and the writing in kind of a tense political environment. Right. Um, There there was a lot of conflict and debate at the time about whether or not descendants of Black people and Afro-Cherokee people who had been enslaved by Cherokees should have full citizenship in the Cherokee Nation today. And people were aligned on both sides and they felt very passionately about their perspectives. So I knew that I was writing into into a fraught political nexus. Mm -hmm. And in order to make the kind of contribution that I wanted to make as a scholar and to help, if at all possible, to bridge that divide, I had to be transparent. Mm -hmm. I had to show people what it was that I thought I was doing and how it was that I was arriving at my conclusions. And that proved valuable. And so I've, I've always done that. And I did that in, in this project as well. 
your your voice comes across as um, confident and clear and open, but not authoritative. And I find the authoritative voice is the one where you do wonder, you know, mm-hmm. you do, and, it, and yeah. it sounds like it's just telling you how it is, whereas you're showing us and bringing us along. But there's a there's a clarity and confidence also to your prose that it doesn't it doesn't make anybody um, you're not leaving it up for debate. You are saying you can go check me, but you're not saying, eh, we can't tell. You're saying these, this we know, you know, mm-hmm. and this we can do some informed speculation about, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, um, I try to present my interpretations and to present the evidence in a way that is open. I mean, I do the best thinking that I, that I can do. <laughs> But I opened it up because I'm one person. Mm-hmm. Even though I've been influenced by many other people, many conversations, and I've been, um, been very fortunate in that regard. Mm. We build knowledge together. Mm-hmm. You know, we as researchers, um, as as authors, as leaders of you know historic tours, as readers, as participants, as site visitors, we we build that knowledge together. And there has to be an openness of exchange. Otherwise, we we get nowhere. And we actually, I think, can exacerbate feelings of distrust or resentment if we present material in a way that feels like this is what it is period right right and so i I do try to write in that kind of voice well i don't even know if i try i think that's just kind of who i am (laughs) i think that's who i am um as as a scholar and as a writer but i do want to just push back on one little bit of something that you said, Nancy, and that is sometimes I do not know. And I say, I don't know. We don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. This is what I have done to try to, you know, track that line of thinking down or what I've done to try to um, dot the I's and cross the T's on that. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I couldn't find it. Or Or in the end, it has not been found by other scholars. And so we're going to have to move into a realm of speculation. We're going to have to give it our best shot using the contextual information that we can bring to bear Mm -hmm. on the question and on the issue. Yeah. And I think using that contextual information was what was done so well in this book because it really expanded the story out so much farther than if you had a story that had so much more primary sources to utilize. So that expansion is where the beauty is and where the where it is so fascinating to readers to um, to read about um, things that you probably wouldn't go into if there was more sources to document and and really expanding that context. And so, you know, in this book, that's what you did with those lines of this uh, that are embroidered on the sack. You just really went you you did a deep dive into them and you really took the theater theoretical magnifying glass to each of these lines, to each of these items that were in the sack. And I love that part of the book. Um, You talk about the three handfuls of pecans. And, you know, oftentimes you would just read that and kind of move on and say pecans. Okay, there were some pecans in the sack. (laughs) But there's so much to these pecans that are in the sack, you know. And and so you really do a a rabbit hole. You go into a a wonderful rabbit hole on these pecans. And you do that with everything that was in the sack, the dress, the braid of hair. And you give context to this time and this place. You give us so much more information about the life of Rose and Ashley, but also the life of the people who are living in their realm, in their shoes, in their world. And so to to, uh, to me, that was just amazing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? And, and you've talked a little bit about this process, but can you talk a little bit more about that process and about um, your decision to kind of write the book this way? Well, thank you, Crystal, for what you said about um, those passages of the book. The things that Rose packed really are the core. I mean, they're they're the they're the gold of the story, including love, including love, including which love. is listed yes. by Rose as one of the things that uh, Rose packed into the sack for Ashley, and so. It made sense. It just, it seemed logical, reasonable, and right to begin with 
those things and to see what they could tell us, especially within a context of um, sparse sources where this is what we have. We know that Rose got her hands on some things and we know that she felt a powerful emotion and we need to start from there. And so I took each of these items and tried to think about them and tried to research them. So in thinking about them, I just imagined them in front of me and just tried to, 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 in my mind, pull them in different directions and, and see what could become more visible or identify the kinds of paths that I could take to understand the items better and thereby understand Rose and Ashley better. And even Ruth, who as the storyteller, who sewed this family story onto the sack um, generations later, she made choices. Mm -hmm. She chose to remember that there were pecans. Mm -hmm. But three handfuls, too. Yeah, like, exactly. you, you have yeah. such a visual of, of her going back two more times to get three yeah. handfuls into the sack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, with the pecans, and, and I never I never expected that I would um, become so involved with pecans or, or you know, nut trees. Yeah. But with the pecans, I think that we can learn so much about Rose's ingenuity Mm -hmm. And by way of the pecans, I was able to arrive at a point where I could speculate with some degree of confidence. I feel that this is right, that Rose was probably a cook. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it turns out that pecans were actually rare and very difficult to attain in South Carolina in the 1850s. Now, this is a surprise. It was a surprise to me yeah. because yeah. I, right, you go down south, you go down to no idea. Um, you know, Georgia, South Carolina, we know that these places are full of pecan groves, right? We know that pecans are um, a big southern nut, probably yeah. the southern nut. Right, right. But, but at that time, they were not being grown with any kind of uh, organization or mm. any magnitude in the mm. southeast because pecans really are more of um, a south, let's say, central western Mm. tree okay they grow naturally along rivers and tributaries in texas mexico you know up to illinois mm -hmm. but they really are not so prevalent in the southeast you might get you know a wild one every once in a while because you know a bird carried a seed or something but they weren't everywhere and so they were a luxury item okay. they were a luxury item wow. in rose's day so that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. well, I, I think so. I can actually probably go on too long about this. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to say one or two more things and then stop me. Okay. But um, <laughs> to, to realize that, you know, pecans weren't falling from every tree meant seeing or led to, to seeing that Rose probably had access to a kitchen and, and to foodstuffs and that she was probably aware of how special these nuts were. And in many ways, not just because they tasted good, but also because they were valuable for trading. Mm -hmm. And so those three handfuls mm -hmm. of pecans could have been so many things to Rose, so many things to Ashley. Right. You know, sustenance, mm -hmm. but also in a way, a, a currency. Yeah. Yeah, because they and weren't going to deteriorate and fall right. apart. She could have given yeah. her other food that wouldn't have been That's able right. to be kept for that long. Yeah. That's right, because yeah. pecans can be stored yeah. for, you know, around a year. Mm. Wow. Which I learned through this. I actually <laughs> um, uh, talk about, you know, going down rabbit holes. I, mm -hmm. I have a little baby pecan tree in my yard right now. Oh. Wow. which is a result of, of the pecan research because the director of the Arboretum at my university was very generous when I wrote him and, and tried to learn about pecan trees and what they do. And I really wanted to know, can a pecan tree that would actually bear fruit, can it grow from the pecan itself? Can, in other mm -hmm. words, can a nut yeah. 
act like a seed. I really wanted to know that. I That's saw that right. you had this in your in the end yes. of the book that you had thanked him for and, and I was like, right. Exactly. <laughs> I wanna know that. You know, I would have gone down it's that important. rabbit hole too. And you can, you can do it. You can. That's fascinating. Yeah. And did she yeah. know that or not? But either way, you know, it was right. someone knew that, you know. Right. Wow. Right. Yeah. Uh, good Good for you. We're going to take a quick station break and then um, ask you a bit more about the contents of that sack. You're okay. listening to The Dirt on the Past with co-hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman or wherever you find your podcasts. We were speaking today with Dr. Taya Miles about her new book, All That She Carried. So we want to maybe potentially dig another rabbit hole and, and we have to ask about the hair. Um, the braid. I love all of the sections where you delved into discussing hair and the hair of, of all the different women who may have been enslaved people at the time and what hair meant to them, what people did to hair, and then kind of give that context for understanding how that braid, that lock ended up in the bag and why. Well, uh, Ruth tells us that Rose included a braid of her own hair in the sack for Ashley. And first of all, what a powerful image mm-hmm. yeah. of this unfree mother who suspected or knew that she was about to lose her daughter, cutting a braid from her own hair and saving it for that daughter. There's so many directions to go when thinking about hair, but one of the first things that struck me about that was when Rose decided to harvest her own hair, she was taking charge of a body that the law said did not even belong to her. So that (sighs) act of taking her own braid Mm -hmm. for her daughter was an act of resistance to her enslavement, an act of defiance of her categorization of of being a a piece of property um, of another person. And in addition to that, hair has so many meanings. Mm. Almost like the sack itself, right? Right. Hair has so many meanings uh, cross-culturally. It has so many meanings for human beings. And it has very strong particular meanings for African Americans. And so in the sections of the book where I talk about hair, I try to open up these different possibilities of, of what hair may have meant to Rose and to Ashley and to other enslaved women, and to women who were free, black, white, otherwise, and to people, um, to human beings, to homo sapiens, right? Mm -hmm. As a connector across our various experiences. One of the things that I want to underscore right now, as we talk about hair, and you can take me in other directions as well, but I want to be sure that I say this. Okay. That is that African-Americans have been disparaged for our hair texture across American history. Mm-hmm. Black hair has, has been called many names and um, black children have, have suffered because of the ways in which their hair is viewed by a dominant society that prizes and values European, a typical associations with European hair, which would be straighter hair. And so this moment of Rose cutting her own braid and giving it to her daughter is very important for our recognition that black hair is actually precious, Mm -hmm. that black hair is beautiful, that black hair contains and holds the love of black women for one another and of of black parents for their children and of black families, as opposed to black hair being a signifier of inferiority or, or a badge of shame. And I say this as a person who has experienced this in my own life. I'm the mother of black and native American children who have um, very curly hair. And I have seen them even in, in our moment experience uncertainty, discomfort, and even shame, which is horrible, which is awful, which makes me so angry, but even shame because of the way in which others 
respond to their hair. Mm -hmm. And so for me personally, it's just so, it's so moving. It's so powerful that Rose gave this hair to her daughter Mm -hmm. and that we can see this braid as a signifier of beauty. And so there are images in the book of contemporary Black artists. I love, I'm so glad you included these, Taya. They're beautiful. Yeah. I think they're beautiful too. Mm. These artists completely reimagine hair in much the way I think Rose's act did. And they hold up Black hair, you know, kinky dark hair as pearls. Mm -hmm. And I think that this hair is a pearl. Rose's braid is a pearl in this story. It's absolutely beautiful, so meaningful, and possibly even magical because of the African-inspired and influenced religious beliefs that many enslaved people had about the way in which hair could represent a person and could be used in a religious ritual in the creation of charms or talismans that could protect a person from the abuse of their enslavers. And so we don't know whether or not Rose intended this braid of her hair to be religious or spiritual in its effect, but we do know that enslaved African-Americans used hair in that way, and she may have been doing that as well, which adds a whole other dimension to the meaning of hair in the sack. Mm -hmm. I was um, just horrified at the parts where you were discussing how hair would be shaved back as punishments. Um, The thought of, I mean, I'm still traumatized by the fact that my mom gave me a Dorothy Hamill haircut when I was in fourth grade and ruined my social life for like 10 years. Um, But no, I I, like just to have somebody remove this part of your body and identity and knowing that also in in the parts you included where that was one of the few ways that women could on Sundays if they were given that day off express their own identity and artistry in the hair and the way they were arranging and doing often very intricate things and then even the fabrics that they may or may not put over it but it just it just there's so many layers of meaning mm-hmm. um and it, to know that it was in there. I so wanted you to find it somewhere, but that wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. But I mm-hmm. I just think it was so wonderful to contextualize that whole like you I feel like you followed it out everywhere it could go. Mm-hmm. And I and I think that's such a valuable thing in the present, right? Mm-hmm. Which is something we mm-hmm. always talk about, Crystal, for people to understand you you have to understand that history in order to understand even as you're saying what's going on with your children today, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, maybe the braid is out there somewhere. Maybe it will uh, be found at some point and um, and be associated with Rose and Ashley. We don't know. We don't know what will be uncovered. But one thing we do know is there are hair cuttings that are saved all across this country and all across the world. I've come across these these. Um, pieces of hair in archives. It's always very interesting, very, very moving and, and, and even startling to come mm-hmm. across them. Mm-hmm. Um, the historian Jill Lepore has written about this mm-hmm. when coming across you know, a lock of hair. Mm-hmm. And so even if we don't have Rose's hair in front of us, we can, you know, many of us find hair, see hair that has been preserved and we can ask these questions about what it meant to the people who clipped their hair and who gave that hair as a gift, as a love offering to other people. Mm -hmm. It it almost, I mean, that seems to have a very amazing universal. There's not a whole lot of things that cross cultures as profoundly as the lock of hair as a token of love and Mm -hmm. and remembrance, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, yeah. excuse me, Nancy, I got so excited that I jumped over you there for a moment. But one of the things that, I love about the hair, this connects to your point of universality, is an observation that Sonia Clark made. Sonia Clark is a textile and fiber artist. She's one of the the artists whose work is highlighted in the book. 
she works with hair all the time as as a fiber, mm-hmm. <laughs> as sort of a thread in her art. And uh, I had a chance to interview her and she said that she adores hair. It's one of her favorite materials, probably because it holds human DNA. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it is literally mm-hmm. a connector, mm-hmm. you know, through families and across humanity, mm-hmm. you know, since we all share DNA, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you go back far enough and, you know, we, we are all related. So much so, nicer than giving fingernails or teeth. You know, yeah. I think there's something way better yes. about the lock of hair. <laughs> yes, yes. But it, is, it grows out of your body I and know. it's this gift and, and yeah. it's often very beautiful, you know, mm-hmm. no matter if it's turned white or whatever, you know, but it, it usually tends to be from people who haven't gone totally white yet. Yeah. And it's such a personal piece. You know, it's so personal, mm. you know, and that's what I always think when I see those in the archives, see those, you know, those um, pictures that have been created from hair or those, mm-hmm. you know, I, mm-hmm. I don't, um, I can't remember what you call them, but um, the hair albums, the, the yeah. hair art, the hair jewelry. Yes, right? yes. I you have some know. photos of those in the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's such a personal, it, it's such a personal connection to the person. Um, and, and just you, it, but you know, in when you see them, you kind of shy away from them too, because they are so personal, mm-hmm. you know? Right. Yeah. Right. It feels yeah. like a violation, Yeah, you know, yes. yeah. having yeah. someone touch your hair. And mm-hmm. um, I mean, we've had many um, friends who are in Montana tribes, you know, kind of saying to people, you shouldn't just walk up and touch because they apparently people just will walk up and touch their beautiful long braid or, or hair mm-hmm. and, and how, you know, mm-hmm. you pe- white people in particular have mm-hmm. to be instructed how not to do that. Yeah. But in so many cultures, it's just hair. It's just such a profoundly important aspect of, of identity and lineage and, and so many things, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And let, let's take this moment to make a public service announcement, which I'd like to do because it's happened to one of my children just this week. Oh gosh, right? someone yikes. So yes. Mm-hmm. It is not welcome. It is not appropriate to approach people and touch their hair. It's just it's just not it is okay. a violation of personal space. I don't exactly. want any listeners yeah. of this podcast to miss that point. Yeah. And they should tell ten people that they know. No hair touching. Just let's just make that a rule. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Thanks I for was saying that I was you. taught yeah. never to do that. I mean, we didn't grow up hair touching, but um, I mean, I know sometimes people do it with kids, you know, but they're like little little kids mm-hmm. because they're toddlers, their hands. But they're, I think there has to be this realization that it's it's not a violation just of your personal space, but of your body and then especially your hair. It's a very intimate. Well, yeah. I mean, usually when people are are tempting to touch hair, they're they're doing so because they want to experience difference. Mm, mm-hmm. so there's a whole, it's, mm-hmm. it's not just, Oh, you're a cute little toddler. Right. Um, there, there's a whole other dimension, mm. to that kind of desire, which needs to be interrogated and which, which people should be aware of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, this is a thing. Okay. This is a thing that many people of color experience, native people experience it, black people experience it. Um, Probably uh, other people do from various groups as well. I don't have those particular experiences, so I can't speak to that precisely. Mm-hmm. And it's disconcerting. It is a violation. Mm-hmm. And you know that includes people who, who walk up to an individual on the street, which has happened to me in Bozeman, <laughs> where, where extreme history is this yeah, more than yeah. once, and say, can I touch your hair? Because mm. even that, even just asking, even yeah. that, yeah, is inappropriate and it's unwelcome. Right. right. You can probably feel safe in touching the hair of your loved ones, your children, your very close friends, your intimates, but not the hair of strangers and not the hair of people that you know casually. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. no, no. I'm surprised no. that during COVID, mm-hmm. you just recently had this experience. Mm-hmm. I would have thought that would have at least given mm-hmm. us a somewhat of a reprieve. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, we want to ask you some more questions. So we'll we'll come back with a reminder at the end okay. not to touch people's hair. We're just going to keep saying that. Right. But um, the in your introduction in this book, um, you talk a little bit about how it's not necessarily a traditional history and that 
this work leans toward, quote, evocation rather than argumentation and is rather more meditation than monograph. Um, So we've talked a little bit already about that word speculation, but I've kind of been thinking of it more as informed imagining, bringing that into history and the importance of imagination in general to historians and in history. And I think this is especially critical when we're doing public history, when we're out of a strictly academic environment and we're we're communicating to the general public who needs to have a story, some storytelling, in order to fully understand the information that's being conveyed. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think we're not just talking about wild speculation, which we've seen rampant in other places, especially in the last you know, several years in our regular lives in the, on the political stage, but we want to talk about something different when we're talking about informed imagination and how it actually helps to better tell the story, I think. So mm-hmm. speak to that. Um, we're not talking about alternative facts. <laughs> that, yes, yeah, exactly. Right. Right. exactly. Um, <laughs> um, what we are referring to is an approach that does look for the evidence looks for the best evidence, tries to find all the evidence that might be out there, the parameters of completing a project. You, you really, I suppose a person could work on a project forever, but that would only be one, right? Right. So we look for the evidence. We collect it. We interpret it in relation to other pieces of evidence, in relation to secondary material, and in relation to various contexts. And we make our strongest best interpretations based on what we have. If what we have is only five pieces of evidence, our best interpretation, though grounded, cannot be as certain. And I think I think that's the difference that we're talking about here. Wild speculation would be, I don't know, it could be my saying, oh, um, tomorrow maybe the sky will be purple. That's my favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> comes to mind, right? Um, that's that based on nothing but my own desire. That's yeah, not what we're right. talking about. Right. 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 We're exactly. talking about grounded interpretation, yeah. mm-hmm. which also brings into the process a creative approach to thinking about the sources, thinking about what can even count as a source, and an imaginative approach, which is willing to say, all right, I don't have a piece of paper in front of me that tells me what Rose was wearing on the day that she packed the sack. But I do have a good deal of primary and secondary evidence that can tell me what many enslaved women would have been wearing at the time that Rose packed the sack. So let me marry those pieces of evidence with the scenario that we know Rose experienced and try to imagine what that moment was like for her. So it's, it's a grounding in evidence, a grounding in sources, a grounding in material that is at the same time willing to take a few steps back, a few steps um, away from those uh, central pieces of, of evidence to try to paint a scene, to try to fill in gaps in a way that can support a story. Because I think you're right, storytelling is so important. And um, it's important for all of us. It's important for us as as people. We we Mm -hmm. seem to be um, storytelling and story hearing creatures. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just want to, before we ask another question about about words and the choice of words that you you used in this text, I just wanted to say that as an archaeologist, um, it was such a pleasure to read a story that focuses on a material object. I was telling Crystal, one of the favorite things that we find are objects that have been modified from their original use or purpose and and or maybe cached somewhere special or becoming part of a bundle. And it, it just gives us so much more personal insight into the people that we're trying to understand. And for me, just thinking that this sack existed for so long until you know, from the 1850s till 1921. And then once 
Ruth embroidered it, it became an entirely different object altogether. I mean, it's the same, but it's absolutely not the same. And, and I think that's part of the power that that hits me. And I'm so glad it's it's found a home where it'll be preserved. Um, and I know we could say much more on that. But I want to just briefly talk about how um, in the end, you have a small section on choice of words and the, the acknowledgement that a lot of people prefer to be moving away from using slave and master, slave and owner, or planter class, and talk about enslaved people, enslavement. There's more action, there's more culpability, there's more sense of whole people being involved and and agency or lack thereof um, when those other words are used. So I just wonder if you give a quick comment on um, that, that aspect that may be occurring in history and American studies with choice of words. When I was in graduate school, I read a number of books that talked about African Americans as Negroes. Mm. And those books were acceptable at the time that they were being published. In fact, many of them were path-breaking books that really opened up the humanity of Black people to readers who were not aware of that humanity. Those readers would not have included Black people who have always been aware of our humanity, right? But uh, those books were making great strides in the fields of U.S. history. And yet their language, when we see it now, feels antiquated. It's definitely uncomfortable. And that same kind of shift in the language that we feel is appropriate or inappropriate, that we feel is fitting or not fitting, explanatory or non-explanatory, has been happening over the last decade or so. When I first started writing uh, my dissertation and and my uh, early books, Slave was commonly used as a way to refer to the people who were held in captivity. But over time, that language has been really criticized and you know put under the microscope for the, the way in which it is sending unconscious, perhaps, messages around the people who are being discussed. And a lot of this pushback came from readers. It came from everyday people. It came from people who were going to museums and I saw sites and were saying, hey, I don't, I don't appreciate having my ancestor called a slave. Mm-hmm. My ancestor was instead a relative or a craftswoman or a, boat, a boatsman. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are so many different ways in which individuals experience their lives and live their lives, that the, that the language of slave not just doesn't capture, but it undermines, you know, it, it obfuscates those dimensions. And so in our writing, those of us who are in slavery studies are working to move away from the kind of language that can convey messages that we don't intend. And slave is one of those words. When we see the word slave, when we hear the word slave, we imagine a servile person. We imagine a person who is reduced to their captivity. Well, that's inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And it is unfair. It's taking away that person's full humanity. And it makes it harder for us to understand their lives. And we see the shift happening in, in many kinds of areas and and with regard to various terms. So uh, the scrutiny that is being applied to slave is also being applied to plantation Mm -hmm. because the word plantation tends to have a romantic connotation associated with it. Right. And so I think the book I talk about my relationship to these various terms and and language, and I, I try to make a case for why I sometimes use enslaved person. Yeah. And I sometimes use slave. Mm hmm. And how when I do that, I'm attempting to kind of shift perspective and to render the full agency and the full humanity of individuals at the same time that I'm recognizing that there were people in that time who absolutely viewed Rose as a slave. Those people were wrong in their thinking, but that's how they viewed her. That's how they treated her. Mm -hmm. And um, in the book, I try to find a way to do 
both, to kind of shift those lenses so that we can see Rose as an enslaved woman, as someone who was so much more than her captivity, but also recognize that her owners, most likely Robert Martin and uh, Serena Milbury Martin, did see her as a slave. This is the reason why they felt that they could sell her child out from under her. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's still hard for me to get my mind around how you could be a mother in those times. And you capture that very well in this mm-hmm. book. But Crystal has our, our last question here yeah. for you. So thanks, Taya, for um, that section of the book, because I think it's so important that we mm-hmm. um, look at words and use words mm-hmm. in, in the way they should be used. Words have a lot of meaning and importance. So so that's great. And, you know, um, this is a hard history. Um, as you just said, Nancy, this, this is a hard history. And... Um, Hard histories um, are what we talk about in extreme history, what you do in your work, Taya, a lot of times. There is a light in these histories as well. I just want to say that. Um, and I think, mm-hmm. and, I, and I'm quoting you and saying that, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that you do find some light in these histories as well. But it is hard history. And hard history has been in our public discussion recently um, around the idea of critical race theory. And there's been a lot of pushback against telling these hard histories. Um, so as public historians, how can we help um, our colleagues, but also the public, get through this time and navigate co- these conversations that are so important to have to help our nation better understand the importance of learning, knowing, and talking about hard history because it's imperative that we do. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I want to start with your comment about light. Okay. There is light in this history because there is light in human experience. And I think it's our job to find it. It's our job to tell the truth, right? Right. We don't want to live in the world of alternative facts. That's right. fantasy land. Right. We must tell the truth. But part of that truth is love. Part of that truth is hope. Part of that truth is the way in which people have been able to carry on despite adversity. And yes, we do um, live in a moment when there is so much political division And when, unfortunately, the studying and the teaching of these difficult histories really has been not just caught up in that division, but used as a weapon Mm -hmm. exactly Mm -hmm. in our our current uh, political contests. Right. It's really sad. It's really a shame. Because I am of the view, and I have been for a very long time, that even if we choose to ignore (laughs) These histories to ignore the facts of enslavement and the hierarchy and subjugation and resistance, we're living with the legacies of those developments and those formations. We're just closing our eyes to the reality if we try to ignore it and try not to talk about it. Isn't it better to actually try to determine what happened and especially why and especially how People who came before us dealt with the challenges they faced and to pretend that everything was, you know, sunflowers and and roses in the past. And there's no way to understand why the world looks like it does today if you don't truly understand the factual history. And so in efforts to make decisions on the future, which is what we always say, you're going to then make mistakes because you're not even understanding what's in front of you because you're not understanding how it came to be. So it's just so vitally important. And um, really, everybody should read this book. (laughs) But I do feel like it's the sense that um, this book both is and isn't critical race theory. You know, it's not explicitly adopting a critical race theory object, you know, putting it out there for a reader, but it's, it's telling a story that someone might then say, they might use that as a weapon to marginalize it, as you were saying before. And I, it's just so much more is going on in this book. Well, you know, I have to take this opportunity to comment on critical race theory and say that when I was in grad school, when you're in grad school, probably um, I was assigned articles and books that existed in the field of critical race theory. It actually is a subfield of academic study 
it, it's based on legal interpretations, actually, the intersections of um, the law and race. And what's happened right now in, in our moment is I feel like, I mean, I feel like the ship has sailed. I don't know if we can ever grab that term back and apply it to its actual original meaning anymore, because, again, it has been used as a weapon. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Someone came up, some political strategist, I assume, came up with the, the great um, the great notion that if we just pick up a few words yeah. and turn them into a boogeyman, we can scare people into wanting to eliminate the discussion of very difficult real aspects of American history from our schools. Mm-hmm. We can scare people into voting for certain politicians. We can scare people into thinking that their neighbors are actually their enemies. Mm-hmm. It's a shame that that has happened. Mm-hmm. And that critical race theory, which is an actual field, has now been sullied and tarnished by this broad brush, which has come to mean everything and anything. So that's frustrating. But but let me just say to you that this book is an exploration of Black women's experience, women's experience, and human experience during a very difficult time in American history. Mm -hmm. There's really not much theorizing that that has to go into it. No, no, that's it. (laughs) It, it, This is a grounded study Mm -hmm. and hopefully a sensitive study of what actually took place in this country. Right. Right. And it's an opening up of, of questions about what do we do with that understanding today. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's a very accessible mm. um, book. It's a very, it's very accessible to, um, to anyone to pick up this book and read it and to learn about this history, this very important history that happened in our country. And then to, and then to um, better understand that in your own life and be able to re- reconcile and to move forward in a different way after reading this book. So, so thank you, Taya, so much for, for writing this book and all your other books that we didn't even get a chance to talk about today. <laughs> maybe, maybe another time, another, t- another, another time, time we can yes. talk about. And, and I'm so excited that you're um, working on another book. It sounds like as well. Is that Maddie yes. Kastner? Is Maddie Kastner coming? <laughs> <laughs> She's coming. She's coming. Good. I mean, uh, I'm going to write that book and do nothing else, but she may not be coming next because uh, there are just so many important things to be working on. Right. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, good. Well, I'm glad she's in the lineup somewhere down she's the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's gotta be. Uh, thank you, Taya. And thanks to all our listeners out there for joining us today. We encourage you to make sure to find a copy of all that she carried. It's available wherever you buy your books and on audio as well. So thanks again, Taya. If you love this podcast, please share it with a friend and make sure to subscribe so it shows up for you each week on your podcast app. We also have a Facebook page called The Dirt on the Past, so make sure to find that and like it too. We put links to all our podcast episodes, but we also include links to articles, books, and other things that we discuss during the podcast. So thanks for listening today, and we hope that you can join us again to find out more about The The Dirt Dirt on on the the Past. Past. A big thank you also to our editor and sound guru, Steve Durbin, and music by Lawson Alegria. <laughs>